Before I begin, I'd just like to take a moment to bring you all greetings from the frozen tundra of southern Minnesota. <laughs> My uh, wife, Shannon, and I are co-pastors at the Congregational Church UCC in Rochester, Minnesota, and that is a church uh, that knows of you. Uh, they know of you through your interim pastor, they know of you through us, and they heard about uh, the ordeal that you went through with Hurricane Ian, and so they have been praying for your community and for this congregation. I also want to take just a moment to say thank you. Thank you for uh, having me here and allowing me to preach this morning. Thank you for uh, having my wife here as well, and thank you for welcoming our wayward former seminary president father uh, <laughs> to be your interim minister. I, he has a great deal of eccentricities that I hear you're putting up with quite nicely. Uh, so we're, we're very thankful for your grace and your acceptance. I also uh, want to thank you for Christmas camp. Anyone that was involved with planning or putting that on, my daughter Ruth got to go three days and have a blast and make new friends and sing songs and learn about the Christmas story. It was wonderful, and I thank you for that. And now, well, let us listen for the word of God as it comes to us from the 63rd chapter of Isaiah, chapter, verse, chapter 63, verse 7 through 9. I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, because of all that the Lord has done for us, and the great favor to the house of Israel that he has shown them according to his mercy, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior in all of their distress. It was no messenger or angel, but his presence that saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Thanks be to God for the hearing of this word this morning. Among my favorite movies of all time is an often forgotten film starring Will Ferrell called Stranger Than Fiction. It's a little less silly than your typical Will Ferrell movie. In it, Ferrell plays an IRS agent whose mundane, routine existence is interrupted one day when he begins to hear a voice narrating his actions. As he walks towards his bus stop, he can hear the voice say, he quickly walked to the bus stop, making sure to keep his schedule. Farrell's character suddenly finds that all of his life is being narrated. He's living inside of someone else's story. There is a greater narrative that he is now a part of. He's not the narrator. He's not the author. He's just a character. And while his decisions can make minor changes to the story, the plot seems fairly set. He is merely playing a role in a larger story that he does not control. Now, as crazy as this premise is, the general idea that we find ourselves in the midst of a larger story, this idea is actually a fairly good understanding of what it means to be a Christian. As Christians, we understand ourselves as people of God, and we develop this understanding when we begin to find ourselves in the story of God's people, the story that is recounted in the Bible. Now, at first glance, this may seem unlikely. The Bible contains texts written two to 3,000 years ago in a time and place much different than our own. How could we, modern, sophisticated people that we are, see ourselves in such an odd 
an old story. Well, I just read a little piece of that story from the prophet Isaiah, and I've got you all here listening, so why don't we try it out? Let's see if we can't find ourselves in the story of God's people. Our text from Isaiah, chapter 63, speaks of God's salvation in the days of old. The old days that Isaiah refers to is the time of the Exodus. It is the beginning of the story of God's people when God chose the people of Israel, chose to be their God and their Savior. This choice did not happen through an application process. God did not select the strongest, wisest, wealthiest, or most righteous people to be his. No, God chose Israel when God heard their cry, their cry of anguish and pain in the midst of their slavery in Egypt. Isaiah tells us that God was moved with compassion and chose to save them. God became their savior in all their distress. It was no messenger or angel, but his presence that saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. The one almighty God, creator of the heavens and the earth, freely chose to love this poor and enslaved nation. This great God came in God's own presence, not through a messenger nor an angel, but God, God's very self, chose to be with the people chose to set them free, chose to carry them all the days of old, God's people have their beginning when God freely chooses to love them and redeem them from their darkness. If you are the kind of person that shows up to worship on the morning of New Year's Day, you've more than likely been doing this church thing for a little while now. I imagine that many of you are like me. You were born into the church and baptized as a child. So let's break that down just a little. Just after you had emerged from the darkness of the womb, there was a ceremony held in a church of God's people, a church just like this one, where God's very presence in the Holy Spirit came to you in water and the words and claimed you in love as one of God's people. God chose you when you were nothing but an infant. Before you could have done anything to merit or deserve such an abundant outpouring of God's love. But if that is not your story, if you've come to this church thing later in life, I would be willing to bet that you also have a story of emerging from some darkness. And I trust in faith that God is choosing you and guiding you into the story of God's people. After all, why else would you be here in church on the morning of the new year? When God redeemed the people from their bondage in Egypt, God opened to them a future gave them a law and a way to live as God's own children. As Isaiah phrases it, God had high hopes for the people, for he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. Well, if you've read past the 20th chapter of Exodus, you may know that this is not exactly the way that things panned out. Almost immediately after receiving the law and the way to live as God's children, the people of Israel abandoned it. They chose to create their own God, to cast a calf out of gold and to worship it instead. And things did not get better from there. Soon the people demanded a king so that they might be like all of the other nations. They began to oppress the poor amongst them. They became rich By their exploitation of their own brethren, they worshipped at the altar of other gods. 
The people neglected the fact that they were God's children, and they did indeed deal falsely. Sometimes, when you are in a new place where people don't know you, you can pretend as though you have always been one of God's good children and have never dealt falsely yourself. I am not quite in that position today. Because although I do not know most of you, my father, my mother, and my wife are all here today. And unfortunately, they know the whole of my story. Though I was baptized by God's own presence in the Holy Spirit as an infant, though I was raised in the church to be one of God's children, I strayed from this path a great deal. Like Israel, I often tried to be like those around me rather than who I had been called to be. Like Israel, I strayed from the covenant with God and I found other gods to worship, gods like self, gods like alcohol and drugs like nihilism and cynicism. These choices, this pursuit of inferior loves, this sin, they eventually brought me to a dark place. They eventually placed me in bondage to that darkness. Whereas I had once been loved and carried by God in the days of old, I found myself shackled by the consequences of my own actions. I had wandered and become lost. Now I may be the only one here who has such an experience of straying from our place as God's children, but I doubt it. When you look over your life, I imagine that you, that many of you can see similar times in your own lives. Times when you went astray. Times when you forgot and betrayed your identity as God's beloved child. Times when you treated yourself and others as less than beloved children of God. Some of us have found our way through these times, and some of us are still seeking a way back, back to life, back to light, back to God. So where does this leave us? We who have been loved and saved by God, we who have been invited to a new life where we could be God's children, we who have nevertheless chosen to deal falsely and stray from God's commandments. Is there still a future for us with God? How can we return to the days of old when God was so moved by pity and love for us that God chose to lift us up, to carry us, and to be our God? When Isaiah describes the character of God's salvation, he places a special emphasis on its mercy and its abundant and steadfast nature. He says, I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, because of all that the Lord has done for us and the great favor to the house of Israel that he has shown them according to his mercy, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. When God chose Israel, it wasn't according to their righteousness. It wasn't according to their worthiness. It was according to God's mercy, to God's abundant and steadfast love. Israel was but an enslaved people, no more or less righteous than any other people when God freely chose to redeem them from their distress. They were saved not because of who they were, but because of who God is. The character of God's salvific love is one of mercy, grace, and steadfastness. When God chose to redeem each of us with God's very presence so many years ago at our baptism, or right now in this very moment in this sanctuary on New Year's morning, this too is God's free choice. And it is also according to God's mercy and not to our merit. 
God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, abounding in grace and mercy, freely choosing to love us and redeem us then and now and always. No matter how often or how far astray we have wandered, the God of loving mercy always welcomes us home once more. The story of love and mercy of darkness and light, of sin and redemption. This is the story of God's people. It is the story of Israel. It is the story of the church, and it is our story. The story continues today, here and now, for God has promised to be with us always, not merely an angel or a messenger, but God's own presence will be with us today, here, and now. In a few moments, we will celebrate Holy Communion, a sacrament in which the presence of God in Christ is made real and available to each and every one of us in our eating and drinking at this table. This presence is the very same presence that redeemed Israel so long ago It is the same presence that saved us at our baptism or brought us here this morning. It is the presence of God, the God of grace and mercy, inviting us once more into the story, inviting us to find ourselves as God's own people, to rest once more in the love and grace of the God who claims us as her beloved children again and again. And again, may we bask in this presence. May we know God's love and grace. And may we leave this place committed once more to playing our part in the story of God's people. Amen.